Good morning. Um, while we are waiting for the presentation to switch, there we go. Um, I'll introduce myself um, and, and my colleague here. So my name is Karen Hegland. I'm uh, a faculty member in speech language and hearing sciences at the University of Florida. I'm also um, a speech language pathologist and I'm in clinic um, at the Center for Movement Disorders. Um, this is Julie Hicks. She is the full-time speech-language pathologist at Movement Disorders, so she's there all week. I'm there on Mondays. And um, together, we're gonna talk about um, the critical function of cough. Um, and I guess I'll preface this by saying it's not brain surgery. <laughs> um, so, um, let's see if we are able to advance things yet. Oh. Hold on one second. I recognize a lot of faces and I apologize for all of the barium I fed you guys. It was meant for, for your well-being. Okay. Okay, well, I guess while we're kind of waiting on that. Um, so, our job at the Movement Disorder Center is to evaluate um, both communication and swallowing. Um, and as you'll get a sense for in this talk, when we talk about swallowing, what we really mean is airway protection, because what our research has shown, what research of other groups has shown, is that airway protection is not just one thing, right? It's not just whether you can swallow or not, but it's whether you have other behaviors that can also help to protect the airway. And so today's talk is going to be on cough, which is an airway protective behavior. Um, some of you may have actually participated in some of our cough studies, and I apologize for the capsaicin. Um, so that's really kind of where we're, we're coming at this airway protection phenomenon from, is looking at not just swallowing, but also cough as an airway protective behavior. Am I good? Perfect, okay. So I guess the first question to, to get us started is why do we cough? Now, we probably all have had a cough at some point in our lives, and there are a lot of different reasons. Um, it may just be due to a cold or flu or bronchitis or something like that. All of the reasons that are listed here are um, indicative of too much cough, right? So, so you, you're coughing when you don't want to cough. Thank you, whoever just coughed. <laughs> um, and while that's certainly an annoying problem to have, it's not life-threatening. Okay, it's not an airway protection problem. It's because there's some sort of irritation um, due to an illness, right? But when we cough because something went down the wrong pipe, that's an airway protective behavior, right? So if food or liquid gets into your airway, you have sensory receptors at a lot of different locations in your airway that should detect that stimulus and cause you to cough, hopefully pretty vigorously to get whatever went down the wrong pipe out. And so in this way, cough is part of what we conceptualize as a continuum of airway protective behaviors. And so you can see there's swallowing at one end, right? So in a safe, effective swallow, we want things to go from your mouth into your esophagus and into your stomach without entering the airway. Um, but if something goes wrong, then we want you to have these other behaviors that are effectively triggered um, and can help get that material out of the airway. And so we think about swallowing kind of in the throat, um, making sure that something doesn't go down the wrong pipe, and then if it does, we hope that there's a cough response that's triggered so that little bit of material comes right on back up. So. This is, um, a, these are a couple of videos of swallowing evaluations. And so for those of you who have seen Julie or I at the center um, and we've evaluated your swallowing, um, we usually try to review these with you um, when we're done. So I will try to um, just go over the anatomy here. I'm trying to see if I have a, a laser on this. Yes, I do, okay. So. I'm just gonna um, go over one of them before I, I play them. So what you can see is, oops, so there's your mouth, okay, and you see your teeth, they're kind of dark here. Um, the lighter space is indicative of um, places where there's just air, so there's not a lot of dense tissue or bone there. And 
the space that's kind of behind your mouth, that's gonna be your throat, and your throat divides into two pipes, okay? Towards the front, this, whoops, sorry, I can't coordinate looking back and forth at the same time. Towards the front, this is your airway, so your voice box actually sits right on top of your airway, and that's gonna be this area right here. And when you swallow, that whole voice box is gonna close up to protect the airway, <clears throat> and it'll actually move up and out of the way so that food or liquid can't get into the airway. Now your food way, or your esophagus, sits right behind the airway, and you don't see it very well when you're not swallowing, but when you do swallow, you'll see it open up to allow the food or liquid to pass into the, the esophagus, and then that's gonna take it down to the stomach. So let's see if we can play these. Maybe, okay. So, this is an example of a swallow, and you see two swallows here. Now the little red arrow is actually pointing at a little bit of material that went down the wrong pipe. Okay, so um, you can see this thin little line of dark material. Um, it looks dark because it's contrasted with barium. That's what allows us to see it during our swallow studies. And when you see it enter the airway, that means it's gone down the wrong pipe. Now what happens right at this point is that there are a bunch of sensory receptors, both in the voice box and in the trachea, that should detect that something is there, give you this perception that, oh, I need to cough and get that out. And then what should happen is this, whoops, can you play the, the second video there, Chuck? Yeah, thank you. So this person detects it, and then they're coughing rigorously to try to get it out. So that's really what should happen, is that even when tiny little bits of material get into your airway, that you detect it and you try to eject it, you try to get it out. So what should you know about cough? Well, first thing is that cough is what we call a sensory motor behavior. And that means that you have a sensory stimulus, i.e. something going down the wrong pipe, and you should have this motor behavior that's triggered after it. So you cough and produce these high rates of airflow that's going to expel that behavior. Um, so you have to detect and then respond appropriately. Um, we think about cough as involving both discriminative and affective processes. So that means, one, is there something there, right? It's kind of a binary yes or no question. And then, is it important? Is it something I need to respond to? And so that's kind of the motivational factor, that it's not a purely reflexive response. You have to process that something is there, and that, that cortex, that picture that Dr. Foote showed you of the most complex supercomputer, somewhere in there, there are networks of neurons that process that this is something that you have to respond to. So um, that component has to be intact as well. The effectiveness of cough, so once that motor behavior is triggered, um, depends on a lot of different um, movements. So the voice box or larynx actually is gonna close up tightly. It's gonna allow pressure to build up from the respiratory system, and then that pressure is gonna um, uh, build up and there's gonna be this high rate of airflow that is produced once the pressure builds to a certain point and it's allowed to kind of flow out of the system. So that's an important component as well. Now, what do we know about cough and Parkinson's disease? Um, this is something that's been near and dear to my heart for several years now. Um, my colleagues and I have spent a lot of time researching cough and Parkinson's disease. Um, and so one thing that we've learned is that that sensitivity, so that sensory leg of the cough, um, seems to be impacted. And so specifically, people with Parkinson's disease may not detect um, or kind of process, so identify it as something that's important to respond to. Um, cough-inducing stimuli. So those can be things like the, the little bits of aspirate material or the capsaicin that we use in our research studies to try to look at reflexive cough. Um, we, we find that people with PD don't, don't detect it at the onset to produce that motor response. Um, when the motor response is triggered, we have found that the effectiveness of that motor response is reduced. So the airflow rates aren't quite as high. And when the airflow rates aren't quite as high, then they're not going to effectively move material out of the airways as well. Okay, so your ability to move stuff out of the airway that went down the wrong pipe is dependent on having enough airflow to, to get it on out. All right, and so we found that that is affected in Parkinson's disease as well. 
kind of a double whammy here is that our research has also shown that cough function is even more impacted. So both the sensory and motory com motor components of cough are even more impacted when people have not just Parkinson's disease, but also disordered swallowing, okay? So you're more likely to get stuff down the wrong pipe, and if you do, you're less likely to detect and respond to it. And so you have something like this. It goes down the wrong pipe, and it stays there. And then, if things build up and stay there over time, you're more likely to develop lung infections that um, might, might occur as a result of that. So what do you do? Um, and I'm actually gonna let Julie talk a little bit now since... Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what do you do? You come see us. <laughs> um, we have a training program that we like to um, talk to all of our patients about. It's called Expiratory Muscle Strength Training. And the picture, let's see, how do you use the little... I just, I click the button. You do this, but you're gonna have to do it on that one. Okay. I could have just said it's the picture, but that's the picture right there. That is our little EMST, and I brought some to show you guys in person. Um, so this is a training program that's designed to target the expiratory breathing muscles, and they live down here in your abdomen. And they're the strong muscles that we want you to be able to harness to get a strong burst of airflow to come out. Right? We want you to be able to do that so you can cough the stuff out that you might have had go down the wrong pipe. So when patients come to me and I see that they have complaints about having a weak cough, they have signs of aspiration or anything going close to the windpipe on their swallow study, this is something I want to talk about. So in the office, I take some measurements of how forcibly you can expire. I have a little uh, piece of equipment called a manometer that will give me that pressure value. Um, I take an average of your maximum airflow, and then I set the device to that level. So it's tailoring it to your specific abilities. What can you do and what level can you train at? Just because you can lift big weights doesn't mean you should always be doing the repetitions at that level. So that's why we set people back to 75% of, of their average. And so this is what the device looks like. And um, the top end is where we have the pressure-loaded valve, and the bottom end is the mouthpiece. The way this is special than just blowing into a straw, blowing up a balloon, blowing into a saxophone is because we can add resistance. So on this end, we have a pressure-loaded valve. And so I can set it to make it easy or twist it righty-tighty and make it harder for you to blow through it. So I will uh, give you a little brief demo. Yeah, I have time. The way this works is you put on this lovely pair of nose clips. I'm gonna have them on, and then I'm gonna hold the device with one hand and hold my cheeks with the other. I don't want air getting caught in my cheeks. I want all the air to be able to go through the mouthpiece so that I'm getting the release of air that I want. Okay, when I'm taking in my breath, I'm taking in from down here, not from here, and not from in my nose. So that's why I wear the goofy little nose clip, so that I'm working these muscles in isolation. I'll know I'll have done it correctly when I hear a rush of air through it. So put these on, set it back. All right. That's it. We couldn't put a bell or a whistle to make it sound more victorious, but all I need is that rush of air to show me that I generated a certain level of air pressure, and I got the sound to come out. Let's see. Go again. Okay, so the biggest thing is you can't just come to me and ask for this. <laughs> um, I want to see you, I want to meet you, and ideally I want to get your swallow tested. We like people to proactively get their swallows tested because, like Karen has already indicated, you don't always know when something is going wrong. You don't always have the same sensitivity knowing that something could be going down the wrong pipe. So we like everyone to at least come in and get a baseline swallow study with us. If you're feeling great and your swallow looks great, I am happy. But I want to make sure there's not something going on below the tip of the iceberg. Um, we do have a, a fun little video that I think we have time to play. And uh, this is a video that 
I made in conjunction with Frances, our social worker. She was a trooper and acted as my patient down in radiology. Just to kind of briefly explain what goes on when you do a swallow test, I know a lot of people have told me that they're anxious about participating. Um, they're nervous because you know, they've had swallow tests where they've had to drink barium before, or they think I'm going to stick something up their nose. So this is different, and uh, you can go ahead and embarrass me and play the video check. <laughs> I'm Julie. I'm the speech pathologist here at the center. I just wanted to give you a little preview about what it's going to be like to have your swallow test done. So your swallow study begins when you walk downstairs to the first floor and get checked in with radiology. And they'll have you sign a consent form and fill out a little bit more paperwork. And then they'll ask you to take a seat in their waiting room. When I'm ready, I'll come and get you and walk you into the radiology suite. Once we're in the radiology room, I'll introduce you to Miss Judy. She is usually our radiology tech. She's the one who will take the pictures. Once you've met everyone, I'll help you get into our chair. If you're in your own wheelchair, that's okay. We'll get you set into the fluoroscopy suite anyways. Once you're all seated, I'll put some towels on you so that neither you or I can spill, but spelling is okay, there's no need to worry. I'll show you all the things you're gonna eat and drink. It's usually a nice picnic of some liquids, some pudding, some cookies, some water at the end, and a fake barium pill if we need to do it. Once everything is all set up, I'll give you some instructions. It usually consists of me telling you that you'll need to hold whatever you're swallowing in your mouth just for a brief second so that Miss Judy knows when to turn the camera on. When you're all done eating and drinking, I'll bring you over to the screen. We'll have any family members that come with you come into the room then as well. And we'll all look at your swallow test and you can ask me any questions or concerns that you have about your swallow. And after that, you're all done. Thanks for watching our video. I hope you enjoyed it. I also hope that this helped calm any anxiety or nerves that you had about doing a swallow test. There is no wrong way to take the test and we're happy to see you. And if you have any more questions or concerns, feel free to let me know. I'll see you next time. So if that wasn't enticing enough, <laughs> um, so all in all, I want people to come get their swallow tested at least once. I'll let you know if you should be coming back more consistently to get it checked. And if you, if you are coming and I do talk to you about ways that you can eat and drink more safely, exercises that you should be doing, I mean it. I don't give you things just for fun, right? These are things that I want to help make your airway protection, your airway health better. Um, and I think kind of the, the whole, whole general take home is anytime you feel a tickle, an urge to cough, an urge to clear your throat, if anything feels weird while you're eating or drinking, cough. <laughs> Don't suppress the cough. Cough is a good thing. We love it. Make it big, make it strong. Anything else? No. Does anyone have any questions? I think we can probably take them on the panel. Yes, okay. So enjoy your lunch safely. <laughs> Thank you for your time.